with things. And now let's continue with our worship service. You may re remain seated during this first song, 10,000 Reasons. I'll ask you to rise when we come to the next.
Come and set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one who fashions us, the one who heals us, the one who reforms us again and again. Let us confess our sin, calling for God's transforming power. Source of all life, we confess that we have not allowed your grace to set us free. We fear that we are not good enough. We hear your word of love freely given to others, yet we expect others to earn it. We turn the church inward 
rather than moving it outward. Forgive us, stir us, reform us to be a church powered by love, willing to speak for what is right, act for what is just, and seek the healing of your whole creation. Amen. God hears our cry and sends the Spirit to change us and to empower our lives in the world. Our sins are forgiven. God's love is unconditional, and we are raised up as God's people who will always be made new. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please be seated.
The Old Testament lesson is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 11, verses 18 through 20. A reading from Jeremiah. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. The word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson is from the letter of James, chapter 3, verses 13, verse 13, 13 through chapter 4, verse 3, and 7 and 8a. A reading from James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The word of the Lord. Okay, I'd love to have the children to come up and join me for a a brief message. I pick your sides. Okay, it looks like we're finally getting here. Okay, I got a question for you guys. Have you ever heard the term topsy-turvy? Has anyone ever heard that word? We live in a topsy-turvy world? No. No, probably not. But I bet your parents have. I bet they have. You know what it means? It's something really weird, and I'm going to read you a little poem to give you a little kind of an idea. A topsy-turvy world is, is one where everything is just kind of upside down. It, you think it should go one way, but it goes the opposite way. And it just seems kind of chaotic and confusing and kind of messed up. Let me give you a, a little bit of an example here, okay? okay? I got a little poem for you. This is called, If Things Grew Down. Okay? Do things grow down? No, not usually. Okay, well, anyway. Here we go. If things grow down instead of up, a dog would grow into a pup. A cat would grow into a kitten. Your sweater would grow into a mitten. Yeah. A cow would grow into a calf. A hole would grow into just half. Big would grow into something small, and small would grow into nothing at all. Now, what if you lived in a world like that? Wouldn't that be confusing if things just did went backwards? 
Yeah, it would take a long time, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, that got to be a kind of a, a topic between Jesus and the disciples. Because the disciples were trying to make sense out of Jesus, and Jesus wasn't making any sense to them. So uh, he heard them arguing. And they were arguing about who's the greatest. Well, now, think about this. To be great, what would you need to be if it was topsy-turvy? Yeah, you need to help the others, but, but what would God want you to do? If you're going to be great and you're going to do the opposite, what would you do? Yeah? Are you waving or are you volunteering? <laughs> okay, if you're, Jesus says, if you're going to be the greatest, you need to be a servant first. Yeah, and if you're going to, if you're going to be number one in the line, you need to go to the end of the line. Isn't that kind of different? Yeah. yeah. But then, you know, Jesus went on to say one more thing. And so he, what does he do? He grabs a child, and he sits there with that child, and he says, if anyone welcomes a little child like this, they welcome me. And if they welcome me, they also welcome the Father who sent me. Now that makes a little bit of sense, but you know what that tells everybody? That tells everybody that in the world of Jesus and in the kingdom, children are just as important as adults. So you kids are very important in the kingdom, and you're very important to all of us here too. Okay? Yeah. All right. Let's pray, shall we? Okay. Dear Father, we thank you for your love for children. So help us to remember as we grow older that to be great in your sight we must come to you as a child. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There you go. Thanks a lot, you guys. As you're able, please rise as we sing together the gospel refrain. Our gospel message this morning is from the ninth chapter of Mark, beginning with the 30th verse. They went on from there, and they passed through Galilee. He didn't want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days later, after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask. Well, then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? Oh, but they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then Jesus took a little child and he put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. It's the gospel of our Lord. Thanks Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. O oh, grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever really stopped to think about how, how much there is about the world and about the universe that you just don't understand? 
I mean, you really just don't understand. I mean, we like to marvel in our, in our own accomplishments, you know, things like building tunnels under seas and through mountains, or doing surgery with small robots. But you know, we've uncovered some pieces of ancient civilization from thousands of years ago that make our work look a little bit, well, mediocre, probably. And we find ourselves struggling to explain it. In fact, it's so mind-boggling that we don't even know what kind of questions to ask about this stuff. Because today, today, of course, it seems like uh, anything unproven should just be avoided. You know, you want to take it, and you want to put it in back, behind, just kind of forget about it. And to understand something, well, that means that, well, we like to not only hold it in our hands, but we want to appreciate everything there is about it, whatever it is, and that becomes a problem. And I think you can see that it can become a real problem in matters of spirituality, especially with God and Jesus, because to see God, to see Jesus in the world, well, that's one thing. But to understand Jesus in the world is really quite another. And that's where we find our disciples today, trying to make some sense of Jesus. I mean, this son of man who had come to save everybody, but says in order to do that, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. Now, the disciples have been talking to Jesus, asking questions about this, and Jesus gives these answers, and they they. The disciples just aren't getting it. It's just going right over here like this. I mean, they've tried to ask for some clarification, but they just don't understand. And we all know that you can reach a point where after asking questions like that, we kind of feel like, uh, well, you know, embarrassed. And you just don't want to do it anymore, so you quit asking. Now you would think that in today's world things would be a little bit different, that with our modern science and our technology that we would be more accepting with the unknown, yet what we're learning about our ancient ancestors is kind of fracturing that line of thought as well. If I were to tell you that civilizations thousands of years ago had very respectable dentistry, would you believe me? Uh, well, did you know that they have found human skulls in Egypt with clear evidence of some very extensive dental work? Actual orthodontics, you know, where they start doing the drilling and the teeth and stuff? I mean, we can't hardly believe what we're seeing in these skulls. Or more importantly, explain it. And there is, of course, more. For example... We have also discovered some very unique soil. I mean, this stuff will grow anything and grow it in abundance. It was located along the Amazon River. Scientists at Cornell University have been studying this stuff for years, and they can't figure out what it even is, other than it's not like our dirt. They have got it dated, though. Carbon dating has it at some eight to 11,000 years ago, so it's old stuff. That's just a couple of examples of the wonders that surround us that undoubtedly, you know, once we do come to understand what they mean, they're gonna serve to broaden our limited intellectual horizons, but today, well, so far, they merely serve to remind us of how we don't have things all figured out. We just can't get there. We, there are things we aren't going to know about, we, even things that we can hold in our hands that we can't explain. And you know, we're going to get to the point where we aren't even going to know what kind of questions to ask either. And that, to be said, without even mentioning, oh, let's just toss a couple other things out, like we're finding buried cities in sand with architecture that's never been seen before. We now know that there are galactic cycles in the universe that directly affect the Earth. 
happens every 26,000 years. And they actually think that that's one of the reasons why they find such lush vegetation thousands of feet below the ice in Antarctica. But what's really sad is that knowing how limited we are in our understanding of creation, we still approach God and Jesus as if they were some kind of religious folklore. It's as if we're just, just kind of lumping ourselves in the same box as the disciples are in. And what does it mean that the Son of Man should be betrayed, suffer, and die? Well, you know, for hundreds of years, we've been trying to answer that question. But oftentimes, our answers are, are more embarrassing than anything. So we have elected to deal with this the kind of the same way that the disciples are. And even though Jesus stood right in front of them, he ate with them, he drank with them, he slept with them. I mean, finally, just to avoid looking stupid, they just abandoned asking him the questions, trying to understand. And, of course, they turned the conversation back to themselves, right? Arguing instead, who's the best amongst us? Who's got the best rank? Who's got the best status? You know, to appreciate this conversation just a little more, I think it helps to, uh, to see what's happened like just in the last 600 years in trying to understand Jesus. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of what um, many of the, of the more reputable religious leaders and some of the theologians and special groups just in the last 600 years have how they've tried to define Jesus. So, Apollinarius. Apollinarius said Jesus was divine with little bits and pieces of the best parts of a human mixed in with the divine stuff in just the right places, all stuck together. So it's like this divine human mosaic of some kind. And that was Apollinarius' explanation. The Ebionites, they said, son of man, just human, nothing else. That's it. Nestorius. Nestorius agreed that Jesus was both divine and human. Okay? But they said, but he said it was kind of like slapping two boards together and gluing them. So now you've got this divine side, and you've got this human side, and they're glued together, so they're separate, but they're inseparable. You know, that was Nestorius, another gentleman by the name of Eutyches. He said Jesus was like mixing honey and water together in a big vat. You mix them together, he says you're going to have to stir like crazy. And you're going to keep stirring and keep stirring and keep stirring. And eventually you're going to end up with a solution that is something else entirely. The Gnostics. Still groups of Gnostics around today. They felt that Jesus was divine only, not human. Of course, there was a problem with that, with the birth, with the divine birth. Others felt that Mary could never give birth to a divine, godly being because she would just explode. Couldn't see that. And then there's the Greeks. The Greeks, in all their intellectual wisdom, just said there's no way it can be both case closed. And you almost say that that's kind of where we are at today. We've got contemporary thinkers now today who think along those lines. They feel it's all in the words. There's a historical Jesus. There's a metaphorical Jesus. The historical Jesus is, is the man. It's the you and I. The metaphorical Jesus is the one that focuses on the miracles, you know, the changing water to wine, things like that. Except these guys also add the fact that it's those things that didn't happen. So the metaphorical Jesus really didn't happen. I mean, honestly, who are we trying to kid with this? We can hold an ancient skull in our hands displaying some very unique dental work and still deny that we're not the most intelligent people to walk the earth. I mean, I guess it shouldn't be surprising that we can hear and read about Jesus walking through the walls of a house, even walking on water, and still dismiss it as ridiculous. So it's not just about seeing. 
Again, Jesus stood right in front of those disciples. I mean, just like this. It's about accepting what seems to be unacceptable. That's the tough one. It's about accepting the answers to questions that seem to be way over our heads, but never being so overwhelmed that we stop asking. And we need to find that to be a comfortable place somehow. Because we do get overloaded. We do get overwhelmed, just like the disciples. And Jesus tries to tell them that he's the son of man, but then he goes on to say he's going to be betrayed, suffer, and die. But does that sound like a son of man to you? Would you accept that so readily? I mean, the disciples expected someone to come riding this white horse with a white hat, wielding a sword, swinging that thing around, going over the hills and slaying all of the disciples' enemies. That's what they wanted. What did they get? This docile young guy standing in front of them who speaks of peace and love and compassion and loving, loving your enemy for crying out loud. That's not... That's, and this person is going to suffer and die. So finally they hit an overload. The disciples, they couldn't do it anymore, and they turned the topic to themselves. You know, it was the greatest amongst us, and in some sense, they elected to abandon the questioning, the wondering, and unfortunately, the glorious mystery of Jesus. Because they just couldn't wrap their hands around it. You know, ancient dental work makes no sense to us, and that soil from the Amazon, it doesn't make any sense to us, even though we have the evidence but does that make Jesus less credible for you, for, for, for me? I mean, especially with everything that we now know about Jesus. Remember, we're the ones now who've had the, the opportunity to read in the Bible about all of these things. We're the ones who have read about Jesus' promises, have seen some come true already. There are more coming. Suffering and death, raising to new life, is walking through walls, his ascension, and we still see his work today in the world. So, can we possibly turn our backs to all of this because we don't understand? You know, I'd like to think that at least in some things we can do better than the original disciples. So, so if you're if you're someone who who has come here this morning or comes to church on a Sunday morning and you think to yourself, man, this is just all really confusing. Thanks a lot, Pastor, right? Or maybe you're thinking, what, uh, what, has been, what is being a disciple of Jesus Christ, where's it got, what's it gotten me into? Well, if that's what you think, I want you to remember just a couple things. We honestly don't know it all. We don't. And there are things that we will never understand. But don't fear your questions. Don't fear your questions. And don't fear asking for answers from Jesus. Ask them over and over and over again. Because you have nothing to fear from the one who loves you and the one who has called you to be his disciple. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, in the midst of confusion and misunderstanding and not knowing, we too back away and turn the discussion of important things to ourselves. Father, we so badly need to take a deep breath and just focus on the love that you have for us and the love that you would want us to share with others. Father, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. As you're able, we'd ask that you please rise and join together with us as we sing, All Are Welcome.
join together and confess our faith with the words of the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ God's only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Freed by God in Christ to live and love and serve, we pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of God's beloved creation. Gracious God, you gather congregations together by the power of your word. Bless leaders with the gifts of wisdom and discernment as they seek to make your church the community for which you long. Lord, in your mercy. Sovereign God, you raise up governments to protect the widow and orphan. Bless citizens with wisdom and discernment as they choose leaders. Inspire leaders to always seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our loving God, you desire health and wholeness. Reconcile the conflicts and disputes among us. Teach us to heal the trauma of racism and poverty. Break our hearts open to all those who suffer and mourn. Lord, we especially remember all those who are on our prayer list. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our welcoming God, you place children among us. So teach us to honor the children in our midst and to pay attention to what they can teach us about who you are. Lord, in your mercy. Into your wide embrace, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your boundless mercy through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. As members of God's household, I pray the peace of the Lord be with you always. And let's share God's peace. We'll continue with the morning offering.
please rise. God of life, you give us these gifts of the earth, these resources of our life and our labor. Take them, offered in great thanksgiving, and use them to set a table that will heal the whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and light. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this wine, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So speak to us, Lord, in the breaking of the bread and make us one with you. The Lord's table has been prepared and all are welcome. Please be seated. Oh 
Please stand if you're able. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and compassionate God, in bread and wine you give us gifts that form us to be humble and courageous. May your words come to life in our serving and in our witness, that we might speak a living voice of healing and justice to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.